Praise God. There is a thought in the Bible, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse number 7. Hebrews 11, 7. This verse contains a word that we will study tonight. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7 says, By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Shall we stand and have a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this day which you have given us. Thank you for the beautiful opportunity of allowing us to meet once again in this your house of prayer to study your word. Lord, thank you for the angels that are among us. Thank you for your spirit that guides us. Thank you for the folks that are here with us. Thank you for the brothers and sisters that have been faithfully supporting us. Dear Lord, thank you for everyone that is following this program anywhere around the world. Thank you for the beautiful day that you have brought to us. In you, Lord, there is no more crying, no more tears. Dear God, allow your blessed spirit to come into our lives and into the life of everyone present so that your truth may begin to introduce itself in the deepest part of our being, so that we may be changed and transformed to live the experience of repentance and conversion, so that we may be new people who praise and glorify your name, Holy Father, so that we may have the right to enter the heavenly homeland. Speak to us tonight, Lord. Speak to us tonight. May the Holy Spirit today bring us word of life for eternal life. God, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen, Lord. Amen. Verse 7 has a peculiar phrase that says, By this faith he condemned the world. What does the Bible mean when it says Noah condemned the the world. That verb condemn in the Greek language means to judge, means to pronounce a sentence against someone, means to condemn, means to indict, means to find guilt. Therefore, the life of Noah, the life of his wife, and the life of his children sentenced the antediluvians, found them to be guilty, and prosecuted them. In the book of Genesis, chapter 6, verse 3, there is another verb that is well known to us and parallels this one. Let us talk about these verbs first, and then we will get into tonight's topic. Genesis, chapter 6, verse 3 says, Then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be a hundred and twenty years. How many years did Noah preach? One hundred and twenty years. Who was guiding Noah? The Spirit of God. Who said that he would not contend with mankind forever? The Holy Spirit. My spirit will not contend with humans forever. The spirit dwelling in the life of Noah, in the life of his wife, in the life of his children, condemned the antediluvians. We have already mentioned the value and the transcendence of the verb contend. Just like the verb condemn, catacrino, it's a forensic verb, a verb of the law, a verb used in courts, a judicial verb. Moreover, this Hebrew verb contend is also a forensic verb. 
The verb contend means. It means to bring justice to, to go to court, to pass sentence, to contend, to act as a judge, to govern, to act in a case, to be in conflict. The verb usually signifies bringing justice to or to act as a judge. What is the point? The point is that this is a legal matter. The heart of the matter is that they are placed before a court, before the heavenly council. Therefore, Noah and his family condemned, sentenced, judged, and defined the sentence of the heavenly court with the antediluvians. That is why Noah condemned the antediluvians. All of this draws one's attention. Why is our attention drawn to this? In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, we find the same verb. In verse 1, here we are setting the table. Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 1. Chapter 11 talks about faith, remember? The heroes of faith. And there is Noah as one of the heroes of faith. Verse 1 Chapter 11 says, Now faith is, what is it? The assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. It's interesting that there is a noun, conviction, but it is a verb from where this word is formed. Conviction. To convict is the same verb that Jesus uses when he talks about the work of the Holy Spirit when he comes down to earth. In the book of John, chapter 16, verse 8, look at what Jesus says about the work of the Holy Spirit. Don't fall behind. John 16, 8. This deals exactly with our lives. Verse 8 says, in chapter 16, verse 8, And when he has come, what does it say? He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Conviction. Convict. The same verb. The value of this verb is also judicial. It's also a verb of the courts. It also deals with passing sentence. It also deals with judging. There is a definition of this verb that I like. Conviction. To convict means reprimand, rebuke, illuminate, reveal, convince of error by evidence or demonstration, to cover from shame. To convict denotes, defines, presents the evidence in such a way, the evidence in such a manner that the accused person cannot say a single word. They have nothing to say on their behalf because they are completely convicted. The Holy Spirit will convict. The Holy Spirit will judge. The Holy Spirit will evaluate. But He will do it through your family and my family in the same manner that the Holy Spirit contended with the antediluvians through the faithfulness of Noah and his family in the same manner today, the Holy Spirit will convict people. He will present before people your life's testimony, your experience with God, your holiness and consecration in such a way that they will be convicted before the heavenly court. I say praise the name of God. The Holy Spirit wants to do such a special work in your life, a work so special in your wife's life, a special work in your children, that He wants to present your family as the evidence that the Holy Spirit is real. The Holy Spirit is effective and efficient. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is fulfilling His duty. In the same way that Noah and his family condemned the antediluvians, in the same way the Spirit will produce conviction, the Spirit will convict, the Spirit will judge the world of today through your experience of repentance and conversion for the glory of God. Would you like to be that model of the Holy Spirit? How many of you would like that?
Honestly, would you like for the Spirit to begin working in your life in such a way that He may change and transform you? So that the people who know you, the people who talk to you, the people who fellowship with you can see, can touch, can feel that your life is real and that the God you worship is real and does wonders in your life so that your life may inspire others to have the same experience? Would you honestly like that? If you would like that, please stand up with me. Let us pray at this time. They say that everything in this world that begins ends someday, and I believe that is true. Dear God, we come before you at this time with nothing to offer. We come before you declaring ourselves spiritually bankrupt, recognizing that we are sinners. We come before you, Lord, covered by your mercy and grace, placing Jesus as our intercessor, our lawyer, placing Jesus, Lord, as the reason for our living. We come before you recognizing, beloved Father, that without Jesus, we can do nothing. That is why, Father, in this moment, we ask that the Holy Spirit may rest in each and every one of us, in those who are anywhere in the world, but also in those brothers and sisters who are here in this place. God, now at this moment, make it possible for the Spirit to speak to us and bring us word of life, words of power that may enlighten our mind, that they may change the deepest part of our being, and convert us into new persons who praise and glorify your name. Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Why is it transcendent what we need to study? Why is this topic so important at this hour? Someone once wrote, speaking about the verb elenco, the verb to convict, that this verb points to the presentation of evidence that is so conclusive that the accused, full of shame, cannot deny or try to argue. This kind of evidence was generally reserved until the day of the judge's final decision. The manner in which the Holy Spirit will convict the world is through the disciples. Their very existence, their way of living, their unchanging conviction, and their permanent testimony. When I was baptized into the Adventist church, I was 19 years old. It was June 30th, 1979, on a Sabbath afternoon at 5.30 p.m. in the church of Gasquay by Pastor Abraham Hidalgo. It was a wonderful day for me, but I had to get baptized secretly. Secretly, because my mom did not want me to get baptized. So from that date on, I began to pray insistently for my mom. My mother was a tough woman, but very hard working. I don't know anyone with such a high degree of responsibility as that lady. I don't know anyone of such a noble character like my mom. We were poor, but my mom always met her commitments. And when she gave her word, you could pretty much write it out. She fulfilled it. But now that I knew the truth, I wanted for my mom and my family to be saved as well. But the lady was tough, and she always said no. Many years passed, 17 years and six months. But one day, by the grace of God, in a conversation that I had with the Lord, things were made clear. My mom got sick. And I give glory to God that that day, I asked her if she accepted Jesus as her personal savior. She said yes. I cried. And since I am Dominican, you know how it is. I don't know where you're from. I told my mom, but do you know what I mean? Yes, of course. Then I told her mom, would you like to accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior? She said yes, I told you yes. But you always say no. Why are you saying yes now? Let me make sure that you are understanding me. Do you want to accept the devil as your personal savior? She says, no. Not that one. 
I thought, she is conscious. Then I asked her, Mom, why now yes, when you have always told me no? Then she smiled and said, Look, son, let me tell you something. You are my youngest son, the little one. And I have a lot of years watching you and looking for reasons to never say yes. And I have said, but if Andres, who is the youngest, has taken this so seriously, has left everything for this, I see that he is all weak with this thing and is only focused on that. We have tried to get him out of it and no one can. So it must be true. Because this is a young man and a young man involved in this. Imagine, because guys are into guy stuff. And she said, I have many years watching you and I made it hard for you in order to see if you would let go. But the harder I made it for you, the stronger you got. She said, then this has to be the truth. That is the reason I accept Jesus Christ as my savior. In the year 1997, on March 17th, I conducted my mom's funeral. And I preached at my mom's funeral. Now let me ask you a question. How do you think I felt that day when I was preaching to the people that the dead know nothing, assured, convinced, and joyful that even though my mom was sleeping in that dream that is death and had been sealed for eternal salvation, do you think that I felt bad? I felt the pain that she had passed away, but I felt the joy and the peace to know that she had died in the hands of Jesus Christ. I remember that in our last conversation that Thursday, the week before, we buried her. The funeral was on a Monday. And I remember that that Thursday, she was very special. Very special. Very special. That is why when I hear no more crying, no more tears, no more death, I tell God, Lord, this is what motivates me to preach. I would like for the whole world to be saved. When I turned 40 years old, I was kneeling and the Lord asked me, Andres, what would you like for your birthday? And out of my heart, a cry came out. More than a request, it was like I was crying out. And from my heart, all that came out was, Lord, I want many souls to go to heaven. It's the only thing that matters to me in this world, that many people may surrender to you. We had our conversation. And she asked me, you have everything ready, Andres? We already knew that she was going to pass away. And so I told her, yes. Did you go to the funeral home? Yes. Did you pick a coffin? Yes. What color is it? It's gray. But is it a coffin that represents the family well? <laughs> what a beauty. I said, yes, mom. And did you order the flower arrangements? Yes, mom. And tell me one thing. Did you go to the cemetery? Yes. I don't like it. I don't want to be buried in the ground. No. Will you bury me in a niche? Yes. But I don't like those old niches that have already been used by the dead. They were all nasty and dirty. No, 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 no. It's a new one. What is my mom talking about? Her death. And I ask you a question. Did something happen in the mind of that woman that she was able to talk about her death? Yes or no? Tonight we will study that when the Spirit of God enters a mind, it transforms that life. Tonight we will see that when the sword of the Spirit penetrates the mind and the whole being of the person, it changes and transforms life. The cosmovision of life is different because man is attached to material things. But when man is born again in the Spirit, his life transcends the material things. Now death is not a problem. Death is a rest. They know that their life is projected toward eternity because the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then she asked me a wonderful question. Look, son, there are a lot of people who are coming from the country and don't have a way of getting to the cemetery. Mom, I rented a 70-passenger bus. She saw that everything was well organized and that the answers were very precise. She looks at me and says, Andres, be serious. Since I was a little kid, she would tell us this. Be serious. And I thought, well, it looks like the lady doesn't believe me. She tells me, very well, so you mean everything is ready? I say, yes. I already have my dress right there. That is the one that I want to be buried with. Now tell me one thing. If you went to the funeral home and did all the arrangements, 
then you had to pay some money to the funeral home. I say, of course. Did they give you a receipt? Of course they did. Where's the receipt? How beautiful. I took out my wallet and took the receipt and showed it to her. Then her eyes were filled with tears. She asked me to come closer. She was very sick. She had cirrhosis of the liver and the medication didn't help. I came closer and she kissed me and smiled and thanked me. <sighs> One question. When I raised my mom's coffin and I placed it on the niche, as they began to close everything and place the tombstone, I had my heart broken in pain because I knew it was my mom who was being buried. But interestingly, my heart was also filled with joy to know that my mom did not die forever. It's interesting that she would tell me, Son, then one cries. But one cries differently because like you say and the Bible says that when one dies is like a dream and one does not know what is happening. Then when one wakes up, one will see Jesus Christ and all the angels. Then I'm going to be completely healthy and I will live in heaven forever. I said, yes, mom. When the Bible reaches a person, when the word of God touches a heart, it transforms his life. What will convict the world is the testimony of those who call themselves Christians. It's interesting to denote that what condemned the antediluvian world was Noah's faith. What condemned the antediluvians was Noah's experience. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. Let us read these passages before going to the heart of the beauty of tonight's topic. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. Let's see what happened with Noah and what needs to happen with us. Verse 3 says, Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be a hundred and twenty years. And verse 5 says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. There the mind is the base. The impulses, the motivations, the intentions of their minds were only evil continually. Verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Despite the wickedness of the antediluvians, Noah walked with God. Despite the weird life that the antediluvians led, Noah walked with God. Despite the social downfall, despite the prevailing promiscuity, despite a life removed from God, despite the paganism, despite the moral decay, despite the total breakdown of society, Noah walked with God. Despite the fact that all families were completely damaged, Noah walked with God. The Bible says, in verse number 13, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Verse 14, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. Verse 17, And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. And God says in verse 18, But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. I ask, did God know Noah? Yes or no? Did God know Noah's wife, yes or no? Did God know Noah's children, yes or no? Did God know the wives of Noah's children, yes or no? God knew that these people walked according to his truth, that Noah walked according to his word, that Noah's family walked according to the word of the Lord. God knew what was in Noah's mind, in his wife's mind, in the mind of his children, and in the mind of his children's wives. A question. 
Did Noah have evidence to explain a flood? No. Did he have evidence to explain rain? No. Did Noah have evidence to explain every detail of what he preached? No. But Noah had evidence that he had spoken with God, that it was a message from God, and Noah had a relationship with God. The question for today is, despite the wickedness that is everywhere, despite the social decay, despite the evil that the world has, do you have that very same conviction? Have you talked with the Lord? Do you have your life filled with the Word of God? Does your wife have her mind on the Lord? Your children, what are they watching? Today, the Spirit is waiting for us to convict the world. It's not about more theology. It's not about more sermons. It's not about more predicaments. It's not about words. Not about more information. Not about more data or more books. The Lord needs a family to testify, to show the world the evidence that shows that your God is real. A family that can show the world that God is fully active in the world. A family that can fill its mind and home with the Word of God. It is impossible to be filled with the Word of God and go on living as we please. It is impossible to be filled with the Word of God and live an ordinary life. It is impossible to be filled with the Word of God and be a mediocre person. Impossible. God does not lie, and the promises of God are true and faithful. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 26, there are three verses that I would like to read again. Sometimes I tell the Lord, Lord, and this is what the original said? And he says, yes, that's what it says. Chapter 26, Deuteronomy, verse 17. I would like, I would love, praise God, that you may apply these verses for yourself. Beloved brothers and sisters, listen to this, please. Listen to me for a moment. Think. Listen, think. The creator of the universe, the one who holds the infinite universe, the creator of wisdom, the almighty. How is it possible for you to be in a relationship with an almighty being and live such a mediocre life? How can that be understood? How is that so? Verse 17. You have declared today that the Lord is your God and that you will walk in his ways. And what does it say? And keep his statutes and his commandments and his rules. And now what does it say? And will obey his voice. And the Lord has declared today that you are a people. And now what does it say? For his treasured possession, as he has promised you, and that you are to keep all his commandments. To me, these words sound as if they were an article from a, from a, from a court, or no. Yes or no? Don't you think it has the manner, the characteristics of an attorney's writing? Let's see, does it or does it not? Yes or no? The following verse says, I like this one the most. My wife and I always joke around with a phrase from verse 18. The phrase that says, for his treasured possession. Right, that your wife is one's treasured possession? Let's see, yes or no? My wife is mine. I don't want anyone to touch her. Yes or no? Or do you share your wife? Be careful. I like when we talk and she tells me, of your treasured possession, I'll be going home on Sunday. It's been a while since I was away from home for two weeks. And we talk every day in the morning and at night, and we talk when I come and go, and we talk and talk and, well, talk. And I asked her, honey, everything okay? She says, yes. Sunday I'll be there and we are going to celebrate. She is fixing the house. She thinks that I don't notice or don't know what she is doing, but she is watching me now. So she makes the house look beautiful when I travel and when I get there, the interesting thing is that she always asks me, what do you see that's new? And I have to say what I see that is new. And you know how our house is very big. So she is taking care of all the details, but that woman is my treasured possession. Oh, let me tell you something. We have time for some inside information. People always thought that my wife was tanned, and it turns out that she is, well, light-skinned. 
Because imagine me with a woman like me, how wonderful. But luckily she is a little lighter than me, and so everything evens out. Our children came out, you know what I mean. They came out looking like their dad. They should have looked more like their mom, because she is a little better looking. But praise God. I like this verse 18, but verse 19 is the one I like the most. Why does God say that we are his people? Verse 19 says, that he what? He will set you high above all nations which he has made to what? In praise and in what? In name and in what? And in honor. And that you may be a holy people to the Lord your God just as he has spoken. If the Lord said it will be this way, why is this not happening? If the Lord said that it will be for honor and fame and glory, why are we crawling in the dust? Why such bad grades? Why so many mediocre students? What is happening? Pastor is getting a little heated tonight, right? What is happening is that they are not filling themselves with the Word of God. What is happening is that they are not doing the family worship. They are not doing their one-year Bible reading. What is happening is that they are not filling their lives with the Word of God. Yes or no? They are not praying or fasting. This is the time for a revival to come to the church, a revival of primitive godliness. It is the time for the Spirit to fall upon our children. But the question is, are we preparing the conditions for the outpouring of the Spirit of God? Very well. Here we go with the heated part, because here the time does not stop. Let us go to the heated part. Noah fulfilled his part. Noah, number one, 120 years of preaching. Number two, made the ark. And number three, his family testified that he was a man of God. How many of the gentlemen here would like to be a man of God? Praise God. Let's get to the hottest part. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, there is a particular phrase that I love. Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 17. Here comes the most beautiful part of this night. Ephesians 6, 17. The Holy Spirit wants to do wonders in our lives. Ephesians 6, 17. What does verse 17 say? And take the helmet of salvation. And what else does it say? And the sword of the Spirit, which is, what is it? The sword of the Spirit. The Word of God. When you take hold of the Word of God, when you have the Word of God, when you make the Word of God part of yourself, when the Word of God enters you, when the Word of God takes hold of your inner man, when the Word of God penetrates your life and mind, what does the Word of God do to you? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. The same thing he did with Noah despite the wickedness of the antediluvians. Verse 12 says, chapter 4 of Hebrews, For the Word of God, what is the Word? Is living, and what else? And active, the effectiveness and efficiency determine excellence. The Word of God is alive, not dead. And the Word of God is active because it teaches us what we need to do. Active defines what we need to do, and efficiency defines how we are to do correctly what we need to do. If you are active and efficient, you will excel. And if you are filled with the Spirit of God, then you will be a new person for the glory of God. We need that experience. For the Word of God is living and active, and it continues saying, sharper than any two-edged sword. And now it says, piercing to the division of soul, feelings and emotions, and spirit, the thoughts of joints and of marrow, and discerning, what does it say now? The thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Word of God, the Word of God, when it penetrates your life, it makes a change from the inside out. It creates a transformation such that the people who know you and see you say, this can't be. When you are completely filled with the Word of God, the Holy Spirit changes you and transforms you in such a way that your life becomes an inspiration for those that say they know God, and for those that do not know God. Your life becomes a light in the midst of darkness, and even those that are called Christians recognize 
that they have been nothing, and that they are inspired by the Word of God, and the Spirit takes them and changes and transforms them, yes or no? Yes or no? This occurred with the Apostle Paul. And this has to occur with your life. One question I will ask you today, and let us take off our masks for a moment. Do we or do we not need this experience? Yes or no? Years come and go, and nothing changes. What's going on? If the spiritual experience you have, if the spiritual life you are living, if the experience that you are sharing daily has not been able to change the life of others and has not been able to cause others to surrender to the Lord, what guarantees you that the experience is saving you? How is it possible to make Christianity and the gospel a culture? I'm with this because I'm with this. Enough of that. Respect yourself. If it's true that you know the Almighty God, if it's true that you are in a relationship with the Almighty God, if it's true that the Holy Spirit is penetrating your being with His Word, your life needs to be different. Would you agree? Change your thoughts. Change your mental patterns. Change your mental schemas. Change your way of thinking. Change your reason of being. And then your life will project and reflect the beauty and holiness of Jesus Christ. Don't we need this? And that will convict the world. I'm going to ask all those who would like to be an instrument of heaven, a model of God, please stand up with me. I would like to ask you, brothers and sisters, and those who are out there as well in the world that is lost, there is a world that is on the brink of losing itself because it has not seen Jesus Christ. No more words, but a living testimony of people filled with the Word of God. Wherever you may be, if you would like to be that instrument from heaven, that model of God, stand up with me and let us pray to God at this hour. And those who are present here today, if you would like that experience, please stand. I will ask you a favor. If you are here today with your family or your wife and children, and tonight you want to consecrate your family to God and do away with your agenda and follow the Lord's agenda and give the Spirit permission to penetrate your mind and heart and to transform you, brothers and sisters, please come to the front saying, Yes, Lord, today I place my life and my family in the hands of Jesus Christ. Does anyone want to come to the front? Praise God. Praise the Lord. Today is a day of victory for the glory of God. There are two thoughts that fill me with joy. In life, I like these two thoughts because they are thoughts of God. They are so tender. In the book of Isaiah, in chapter 66, verse 2, it says, God says, For all those things my hand has made, and for all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this time one will look on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. I like the tenderness with which God says it. There is another beautiful thought in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter number 5, verse 29. God says, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments that it might be well with them and with their children forever. What a beauty. Don't tell me that this is not a beautiful thought from a loving father. My children, if you decide to keep my commandments, if you decide to fear me, if you decide to do as I say, then it will all be well with you forever. Would you like for everything to go well with you? Yes or no? I like another passage that is near this one in the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 8. The words of God say, Joshua 1, 8. Look at this beauty. The book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success.
Praise the name of God. Do you dare to make that covenant with God this hour? Dear friends, wherever you may be, brothers and sisters, make that covenant with God. Decide to live from the word of the Lord, and you will see his wonders. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you very much for your promises are faithful and true. Thank you for the work of the angels. Thank you for the work of Jesus on our behalf. But loving Father, thank you so much for the Holy Spirit that convicts us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Today we come before the throne of grace. We come before your altar so that we may consecrate our lives and our families to you. To each person, wherever they may be, that has made his decision, anoint them with your spirit also, Lord, from now and forever. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen, Lord. Amen, Jesus. Amen.